thank you very much for the invitation. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here because, as Stefan has said, um, in the UK we have a network of hubs for trials methodology research and we're very keen um, to work internationally um, with the network here in Ireland. So um, I always start my talks about Comet by just asking um, who had heard of Comet before they saw it on the programme? Could you just put your hands up? Oh, excellent, great. It is about 50% most, most of the time these days, so that's great. Um, okay, so, ooh, can't read the slide. So this is a, a matrix that Cochrane Systematic Reviews have produced, and those of you, I'm sure many of you have been involved in, in some form of systematic review. Um, you identify trials and you extract information on the outcomes reported in those trials. And this is a matrix where the rows are the trials and the columns are the outcomes chosen by the systematic review team. And if you can read it either at the front or the back, what you'll see is there are various Ys in the cells, which mean, yes, that outcome was measured and reported, but there are a lot of gaps. So this is a very common feature of systematic reviews, that there is heterogeneity in the outcomes measured in trials across the world. And so the questions that we raise here are, well, how did the trialist at the top decide which outcomes to measure? How did the trialist at the bottom decide which outcomes to measure? And indeed, for the reviewers, how did they decide those outcomes that form the columns? How did they decide what were important outcomes? But more worryingly, well not more worryingly, but as equally worryingly, the gaps. Do, are we really sure that those outcomes weren't measured? They may have been measured and not reported. And that may have been because the results were not as the trialist wished them to be. And this problem of suppression of outcomes based on the results is referred to as outcome reporting bias. And it's analogous to publication bias, which is typically where you don't publish the entire study. So the message is what you're reading in the literature, whilst it's in the literature, which is good, it may not actually be the whole story. So there is um, overwhelming evidence now that there have been problems with outcomes in trials. And one possible solution to reduce these sorts of problems is known as a core outcome set which is an agreed, standardised set of outcomes that should be measured and reported as a minimum in all clinical trials in specific areas of health or healthcare. So Comet um, coined this definition, um, and we have to stress in Comet that the, the as a minimum is really important. So we fully expect trialists to measure other outcomes as well, but if we can't get at least some agreement, some consistency, um, between trials across the world, then um, we're really um, not making the most of the, of the research effort. What I haven't said, um, in the interest of time, I have not presented the most important slide, which is actually who's Comet. Who's, there, is a, there is a management group for Comet uh, that looks after Comet on a day-to-day -day basis, um, and that includes Mike Clark, who you've heard this morning, um, Jane Blaisby, who's a surgeon from Bristol, Doug Altman, who I'm sure you'll know uh, in Oxford, runs the Equator Network, and Sean Tunis from uh, the States, who runs the Centre for Medical Technology and Policy. But we also have lots and lots of international collaborators, including Declan uh, and some other people here. And also, I don't know if you said this, Declan, but in fact, HRB actually refers to Comet in their guidance as well. So that's fantastic. Thank you, Trevor. OK, so um, in terms of core outcome sets, when we first sort of started Comet, we were thinking about the scope of a core outcome set being very sort of related to the PICO statement for a trial in terms of the PIC bit, um, in terms of the health condition, the population, and the types of intervention that this core outcome set might apply to. And Comet, you'll have noticed that the E stands for effectiveness trials. And when we started Comet in 2010, because we were coming from the world of systematic reviews and trials, we were only thinking about core outcome sets for effectiveness trials, but we've realised over the course of the last few years, and in doing systematic reviews, that there are actually core outcome sets that are being developed for routine care, core outcome sets that are being developed for both effectiveness trials and routine care. Um, and so we've added in to the scope um, the bottom bullet point here, which is, is this a core outcome set that is 
purported to be relevant to research or is it for routine care? Um, and this choice of example, which you still can't read, um, was, uh, it, 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 it wasn't by chance. One of the most well-known core outcome sets um, has been developed by the OMARAT group for uh, treatments of room, people, patients with rheumatoid arthritis. Um, and these trials are actually all before 1994, which was when the core outcome set was published. So the core outcome set includes seven outcomes. And what I'm plotting on the screen here is the x-axis is time. And hopefully you can see the uh, vertical line marked at about 1994, which is when the OMRAC group, it was actually an agreed core outcome set between the World Health Organization and the International League Against Rheumatology, when that was published. And the y-axis is the percentage of trials that were reported in those years that fully reported all seven outcomes in the core outcome set. So you can see that, you know, up to about the time of publication, there was a general kind of consensus forming, but it was the minority of trials. Then you'll notice that after about 2000, there was an increase from 40% up to 70% of trials reporting. And I don't think it's um, any coincidence that that was following the regulatory guidance that trialists um, working with patients with rheumatoid arthritis should measure and report these outcomes. So both the EMA and the FDA in the States recommended this. But you can also see from this slide that there's still some more work to be done. So this was 2010, and there was about 70% measuring and reporting the core outcome set, but there's also 30% who aren't. Okay, so there's work to be done about uptake and why trialists uh, might not be following the core outcome set. Some work that we've done suggests that it's actually the uh, lack of awareness of core outcome set work, even though there's been international agreement. And we're very interested to find out from trialists where do they go to find information to inform their trial design. We heard from Mike that you know the ideal is that you review what's been done before, um, but we also know that not everybody does do that. So we're very interested in, in where trialists seek opinions from. Just through that. Okay, so Comet, the Comet Initiative, um, as I said, the, core out, the idea of a core outcome set is not new. Uh, the World Health Organization published the first core outcome set in cancer in 1981. Um, what is new about Comet then? Comet really formed because there are a lot of people in the same room in Liverpool in 2010 talking about problems in outcome reporting and choice of outcomes, and we suddenly realised that we all had to do something about it. So this is one piece in this um, jigsaw. And we have um, six objectives now. We started with three. Um, we give lots of talks. Mike, Mike does too about raising the awareness of the problems, current problems with outcomes in trials. We're trying to encourage core outcome set development. And I know that Declan and colleagues are involved in a number of core outcome sets that are ongoing. One of the things I'm going to say a bit more about is we are really keen to promote public and patient involvement in the choice of outcomes in clinical <coughs> trials. We're wanting to produce resources and, and, and avoid unnecessary duplication of effort. But also thinking about how you develop core outcome sets in the same way that we want um, clinical medicine to be evidence-based, we also want the methodology to be evidence-based. So thinking about the resources, the key resource in Comet um, is the website, but actually it's the database. So on the uh, middle left of this, there is a publicly available searchable database that you can go to. And if you're interested in asthma, you can type in asthma and you'll see what comes out of the search in terms of core outcome sets relating to asthma. The database has been populated um, through a systematic review. And this is over time uh, on the x-axis. You'll see that this, the y-axis is, is the number of core outcome sets that have been published. You'll see that there's been a steady increase over time, and we're not expecting that to uh, tail off. We're expecting it to continue to increase. There are currently in the database 305 core outcome sets, 72 of which are ongoing. So the Comet database also acts... Uh, as a means for people registering 
their projects that are ongoing, which means that if you also have an interest in a particular area, you can join forces with a group who may be working in Australia or may be working in the States. Um, so it's a way of linking people together as well. But as well as core outcome sets, we also want to give people information that might help them to develop core outcome sets. So um, as we've done systematic reviews, we've also picked up reviews of outcomes in trials. So there has been a review of the last 20 years of asthma trials in, with children. What were the outcomes that have been measured in all of those reviews? And similarly, people have worked with patients to find out what are the most important outcomes to them and publish that as a standalone piece of research. And that's helpful to core outcome set developers. So all of that information is going into this uh, repository, the Comet database as well. So is anybody interested? Um, we, we occasionally, I think once a year, have a look at the Comet website statistics. And the important points here are there's been a tremendous increase in uh, access from people around the world. So if you look at the third bullet point, visitors last year, when we first started, it was very much a UK-focused activity. We were starting things up, um, doing the systematic reviews, populating the database. We now find that people from the UK are the minority. Okay? So the majority of people visiting the website are from outside of the UK. And uh, we recently held our International Comet meeting in Calgary, um, and we were delighted that we could report uh, that there were 16% of people from North America who'd visited, uh, sorry, 16% of people visiting the Comet website had come from North America. There have been lots of searches run on the database, and we suddenly realised we didn't know why people were searching the database. We thought, well, it'd be quite interesting. And I'm not a big fan of, of things popping up when I do an internet search, which is not that often. But um, However, I couldn't resist. Well, we couldn't resist in the management group. We actually wanted to know what are people looking at this database for. So we did a four-week pop-up survey. It was one question. And we actually found uh, you know, 50% of people responded. And apparently, I don't know, there's probably people here who know more about this sort of thing than I do. That's quite a good typical response rate for a pop-up pop survey. And the uh, most frequent reasons were um, what we might have thought, what we hoped, people were developing a core outcome set. Or middle of that table, people were planning a clinical trial. So the users of core outcome sets were actually looking at the database. There was also a lot of activity that was just general educational activity. We know that people are now starting to teach about core outcome sets and the Comet Initiative in sort of health service re research related courses. But there's also an interesting one, though. Which I've been asked to take part in a core outcome set study, and that wasn't something we'd necessarily thought. Uh, people would be, They're obviously looking to see uh, uh, what's going on in, in the area that they were being asked to take part in. There are nine people. We thought we'd done a really good job of finding all the possible reasons that you might want to search the Comet database, but there are nine people who flummoxed us, and because we were advised that you're only, you'll only get people to click one thing on a pop-up survey and one of the things was none of the above we couldn't go back to them and say what, what was that so if any of you happen to be in that nine we'd be really really pleased or if you can think of anything that's not on this list I presume the slides will go on the website at some point so all right with all of this activity um, increasing in core outcome set development we started this because we wanted to reduce research waste from those sort of outcome matrices that you see in Cochrane yeah. reviews and other systematic reviews very frequently. But of course, if all of this work is done and nobody uses and implements the core outcome set, then in effect we're <laughs> encouraging even more research waste. All of that time spent developing core outcome sets if nobody's going to use them is a waste. So we have spent quite a lot of time um, promoting core outcome sets to various people and we've done reasonably well so far we think so Comet, the Comet database as a resource is now referred to in a number of different places such as the spirit guidelines which is standardised uh, reporting for protocols um, trial funders thanks to Theresa and HRB and, and we've done really well with, at NIHR in, in UK but it taught me a lesson the reason we've done really well in the NIHR is because Hal Williams 
who was uh, chair of the NIHR HGA commissioning board and is now uh, involved in the HGA board, um, developed a core outcome set, is an absolute core outcome set fan, enthuses and promotes them. So I learned very quickly that if you really want uptake and dissemination, that one-to-one -one communication and getting that opinion leader to uh, promote the cause, that's really, really important. So now what we're trying to do is identify friends and colleagues who want to support Comet in 31 countries. We've found 245 research funders and we want those people, ambassadors, to go and have those one-to-one -one conversations because although I'm hoping that you're all sitting there thinking, it's such a simple idea, why hasn't it been done before? Um, it is, it is a simple idea, but it hasn't been done before. Um, but we're hoping that once that, you can have that conversation that people will see it and refer to the people to the Comet database. Um, okay. So one of the things we want to do by virtue of putting the database uh, out there publicly is to avoid unnecessary duplication of effort. And we actually had our first concrete example of that last year, or, well, this year. So somebody inquired about a core outcome set in delirium that they wanted to work on um, last year. And then in May of this year, we had a separate inquiry. So our project coordinator, Liz Gargan, who's, who's not here today, but she managed to put those two researchers together and they're moving forward with a shared programme of work and these are in two different countries. And by now I can probably put their names on, but I, but I wasn't able to until recently. So in terms of developing the core outcome set, um, we realised having looked at these um, 227 published core outcome sets that there wasn't a gold standard method. So now, although for randomised trials, we, we tend to have good guidance to go on what, what are good methods for trials, there is no such guidance for core outcome sets. We decided we needed to uh, write something, but not guidance. So we highlighted some issues to consider. And I just wanted to kind of give you uh, an idea of why we thought we needed to write something. So across the published core outcome sets, there's been a whole host of different methods, ranging from um, a, a sort of unstructured chat by experts around a table through to something uh, much more um, structured, perhaps a systematic review of the literature, followed by a Delphi study, followed by a face-to-face -face consensus meeting. So there's two points to make about this slide. The first is that at the moment there is no existing quality assessment tool for core outcome sets, so we are not quality stamping anything in the Comet database. It's a resource for people to look at, to consider, Core outcome set use is not mandatory by the NIHR or HRB. It's simply go and have a look. If you think that the work that was done was rigorous and you want to use the core outcome set, that's fine. Um, if you don't, it's useful to explain why not. But the other point of this slide, you'll see that 18 of those published core outcome sets didn't say how the, what methods have been used. Um, and for the others, there were really important aspects of the methods that were missing. So uh, there is a need for a reporting guideline here. Uh, we noticed between the original review that was up to the middle of 2013 and our recent update of that review up to the end of 2014, there's been a suggestion of, of changes going on, an increase in the percentage of core outcome sets where there was a systematic review of outcomes in trials. So actually looking at what's been done already, that seems to be on the increase. Delphi surveys is definitely on the increase. So there were 15% of the core outcome sets up to the middle of 2013 that used a Delphi as part of their work. Up to 2014 then, it increased to 31%. And of the 72 ongoing studies, 80% are using Delphi studies. So for those of you that don't know, it's where you uh, have an anonymous panel, maybe internationally, you can do this online, uh, you score a list of outcomes um, all anonymously, you then in round two, you have feedback from what the group felt, you can rescore, and then you can keep doing that until you reach consensus. Now, Delphi's not without its critics, okay? <coughs> so we're particularly keen in Comet to really understand whether the Delphi method, which appears to be 
uh, almost by default becoming the standard, is that really the best method to use as a component in the development of a core outcome set? One of the key things, whether you use a Delphi or not, is who is making the decision about the outcomes to recommend in the core outcome set? Here is a start list, if you like. Uh, there are other people that might uh, be involved in the, your particular area of interest. Um, but it's also true to say that not all core outcome sets have involved all of these people. All of them have involved healthcare professionals. Okay? That's the only thing you can say that is common across all of them. Okay? That's not a surprise. But if you look at what we think is the equally important stakeholder groups, patients or carers, patient representatives, service users, depending on the context, what you can see is that um, originally up to 2013, only 18% of the core outcome sets that were published had involved patients in giving their views. That's changed dramatically. And of the ongoing core outcome sets, 89% involve patients. Okay. And I'm sure that involvement of patients in health research generally um, that's um, reflected here um, is as a result of the increase of, of patient involvement in, in health research. But in response to this increase um, of involvement, COMET has set up what we're calling the POPI group which stands for people, so that P-O is a bit forced, but it's the, that's the O for people. People, participation, uh, sorry, people and patient participation, involvement and engagement working group. Um, I'll say a little bit more about that in a minute. Just coming back to the methods. Have I got time? Oh, a few minutes? Okay, coming back to the methods. There are some key issues, key questions about the methods. And one of the first questions is, if you've got different stakeholder groups where you don't feel you want to necessarily assume from the start that they're going to have the same views, how are you going to integrate their views part way through or at the end? One of the other questions is, well, if you've got mixed stakeholder groups and you want to do a Delphi, for example, or some form of consensus, should you put everybody into the same panel and assume that they have the same views? Or should you run separate panels, a panel for health professionals, a panel for patients, a panel for policy makers? These are the sorts of methodological questions that we don't yet have the answers to. One of the core, first core outcome sets that I was involved in was for um, children with uh, cleft lip and palate, sorry. <clears throat> um, and uh, what we decided to do there, we'd seen work that suggested that patients and health professionals were not necessarily going to have the same view of what was important in terms of outcomes. So we decided not to assume that they, they would. And we, at the time, we weren't brave enough to try to run a Delphi survey with patients. So we did a one-off survey through the patient association. Um, we were a bit braver with health professionals and we got them to undertake a Delphi, but we didn't actually think that the mix of health professionals treating children with cleft, which was, involved surgeons, audiologists, psychologists, we didn't think that they were necessarily going to have the same views either. So we actually ran a Delphi with separate panels for the health professional groups and coming in after round two, we showed them the patient views. The conclusion from that work, which is the Harmon statement here, was that multiple rounds completed by health professionals resulted in changes being made to scores, indicating that the responses of peers, parents, children and other health professional groups had an impact on the perceived importance of outcomes. There's also been work done nesting randomisation in terms of the feedback given to health professionals and patients, and that paper that's just been submitted suggested that providing feedback within Delphi questionnaires from all stakeholder groups separately may influence the final core set and improve consensus between the groups. So COMET is trying to um, collate research around the methodology of developing core outcome sets 
And all of these papers, when published, will go into the comet database as well. What I've been talking about to date in terms of the development of core outcome set, we're tending now to think of this as a two-stage process. First of all, to agree what to measure, and secondly, to then go on and decide how to measure it. Because you may think that pain is important in a particular clinical area. Pain may be the what. How do you measure pain? Arguably, pains are not a good example because there are all sorts of aspects of pain, but there are certainly lots of different ways to measure pain. And we've recently um, done some work with the COSMIN initiative in uh, the Netherlands, and a paper has been submitted giving guidance saying, once you know what you want to measure, here is then an approach to deciding how you choose how to measure those outcomes. So there is methodological work going on. So just to finish, in terms of COMET going forward, one of the most important things that we need to do is to keep that database up to date. So we annually update our systematic review, um, which is no mean feat, because to find 29 new core outcome sets, we had to look through 5,000 abstracts. Um, as I've said, the reporting of core outcome sets is not great. We're developing a reporting guideline at the moment. We're trying to collate the methodological research that people have done into a handbook. We have developed some software that I know some people here have used for, for running Adelphi online. And we are trying to put new core outcome set developers in touch with more experienced ones. So Declan is on our list of, of people willing to help and give advice. So uh, thank you very much, Declan, for that. Um, we are happy to host uh, and, and help organise local network meetings. As I've mentioned, we are keen to promote the involvement of patients and, and carers and parents um, by, through the Poppy Working Group. Things that are really on the agenda are how do we quality assess core outcome sets? And similarly, how can we improve uptake? What is uptake? And how can we improve it? I'll finish there. Thank you very much for coming.